Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all uh, hear there, here in the back? All right. Uh, welcome to this uh, BGSU Black History Month lecture. So today's lecture, I'm really excited. Uh, today's lecture by Dr. Shirley Green is titled Revolutionary Blacks, Discovering the Frank Brothers, Freeborn Men of Color, Soldiers of Independence. It's presented by the BGSU Department of History with support from the BGSU School of Cultural and Critical Studies and the BGSU uh, Division of Diversity and Belonging. Uh, now, I, my guess is that many or maybe most of us here uh, have already had the pleasure to work with uh, and maybe, and well, and to know and to learn from Dr. Shirley Green. Uh, one thing that uh, some or maybe all of you may know, I don't know, uh, is that Dr. Green's life story is as compelling as uh, the stories of her ancestors, Ben and William Frank, uh, about whom she'll talk today. Uh, Dr. Green served over five years, at least five years, is that fair to say, in the Toledo Police Department? 26. Uh, I I was trying not to know, say it. No, that's okay. <laughs> Just put it out there. I'll go <laughs> um, rising uh, to the rank of uh, a lieutenant, she got her PhD here at BGSU, uh, and she, where she wrote the dissertation upon which uh, her book is based, uh, advised by Dr. Ruth Wallace Herndon, and it won the 2012 BGSU Distinguished Dissertation Award. From 2010 to 2014, she served as the city of Toledo's deputy mayor for public safety and personnel. And since 2016, she's been the director of the Toledo Police Museum. Uh, she's taught and continues to teach uh, at some institution north of here as well <laughs> as uh, BGSU. Uh, various courses, including, uh, of course, about the American Revolution. She's presented her work at a range of disciplinary and public venues. Uh, and today, she's going to be uh, discussing portions from her recently published book, Revolutionary Blacks, Discovering the Frank Brothers, Freeborn Men of Color, Soldiers of Independence. It's a fantastic family story. It's a fantastic story uh, about the American Revolution. It's a fantastic uh, African-American story, and it's a fantastic American story. Uh, and so we are really delighted and, and privileged and, and lucky to have uh, Dr. Green here. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Green. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, coming this afternoon. It's a nice day, but it's still kind of chilly out. I wanna thank uh, the Department of History at Bowling Green State University, um, Department Chair, Dr. Chulu, for uh, having me be involved in this uh, presentation for Black History Month. I also want to thank Becky Brown, who's at the back of the room there, the outreach coordinator for the Department of History for all her, her help setting this up. Please let me know if you can hear me or not. Are we good with the hearing? Okay. Um, I wanna thank Andy for that wonderful uh, introduction. I know he was trying to make me a lot younger uh, with my tenure on the police department, but I just go with it. Um, I also wanna thank Andy for uh, making my transition from being a grad student at the University of Toledo to being a grad student here at Bowling Green State University. That was very, very helpful for me. And last but certainly not least, I wanna thank uh, Professor Emeritus Ruth Wallace Herndon she uh, she really guided my dissertation and she has read, I don't know how many different versions of the manuscript before it actually went to publication. So I wanna thank her uh, intensely. So my book, as Andy said earlier, is part family history, part micro history. Micro history is when you focus on a person, an event, a community or a location on a small level to tell a bigger story about historical events and trends. Many family historians and micro historians start out on their research trying to answer questions or mysteries about a certain ancestor or a certain aspect of history. So I'm gonna start with my background. I was born and raised in Toledo, Ohio. I know, University of Toledo, but Toledo is a good place. So was my father, he was born and raised there as well. My mother, however, was born and raised in Lynn, Massachusetts. Her father was born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada. So when I started my research, 
I was trying to answer the question of how my maternal grandfather came to be born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada. As I started to address that question, another question arose. How did the experiences of my ancestor inform us about the experiences and actions of free Blacks in revolutionary America? This book over my shoulder here is a culmination of my journey to answer those questions. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this young man. That's my maternal great-grandfather. His name is Thomas Henry Franklin. He was a landscaper at one of the oldest cemeteries in North America in Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia. This picture was taken by a local historian named William Ingalls, who was conducting research for a book on the oldest gravestones in North America. The book is titled, The Gravestones of Acadie. They had a conversation that day, my great grandfather and the local historian. In the late 1920s is when this uh, conversation took place. Some of that conversation is on the screen. What is your name? Local historian asked my grandfather. My name is Henry Franklin an uncommon name in these parts. My grandfather came from Africa. Then he asked him, how old are you? And he said, I just turned 70. And it's amazing to me that uh, I am now telling Thomas Henry Franklin when I just turned 70. So it's kind of cyclical, this whole Franklin uh, oral tradition. Henry Franklin passed away shortly before the publication of the book in 1929. He recited a small part of the Franklin oral history to William Ingalls. The entire Franklin oral tradition was that the first Franklin ancestor came to America from the west coast of Africa by way of Haiti, and two of his descendants, two brothers with the last name of Frank, fought in the Black Revolution of Rhode Island in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. I believe that the first Frank came to the Americas by the late 1600s, and this is backed up by DNA testing. This individual was caught up in the traffic that was the transatlantic human trade. He came to North America from the west coast of Africa. He was a member of the Away people who reside in present-day Togo and Ghana. This young man arrived in the Caribbean and was set to labor in the plantations of the French colony Saint-Domingue, which is present-day present Haiti. Either this young man or one of his male offspring became a victor of, excuse me, a victim of the intercolonial human trade between the Caribbean and mainland North America. He was sold into slavery in Rhode Island and set to work in the town of Providence, Rhode Island. I believe that the first Frank ancestor in America was captured in five separate documents living and working in colonial Rhode Island. By the late 1690s, this man was free and an active member of Providence, Rhode Island, and he was known by the name of Frank. He owned a parcel of land, and he worked as a servant of a large land-owning family named the Carpenters. The pictures of the screen are, on the screen are four different of uh, those documents that I used to try to put together the life of Frank Negro. The first document on top of the screen uh, notate the sale of land to Frank. And as you can see where the red arrows point, it says Frank Negro Servant of Silence Carpenter. Now in Rhode Island and in New England, instead of using the word slave, they had a tendency to use the word servant as the same meaning as an enslaved person. Um, the next document down under 47 says that be it known unto all that I, Frank Negro Servant of Silence Carpenter, have now mortgaged that land off that he just bought a month before. Then several years later, Frank Negro pays off that mortgage, but he is notated differently in the document. He is now just Frank Negro of Providence, right? Not servant of, which means that some, sometime between mortgaging the land off and paying off the mortgage, he gained his freedom. A really interesting document to the left of the screen is an assault warrant, assault affidavit where Frank Negro was accosted on a public street in Providence, Rhode Island. Now, the document says that there was some provocation on the part of Frank Negro. He started the argument, but a young man by the name of Sprague hit him, assaulted him, and Frank went to the uh, officials and swore out a warrant for him, and Mr. Sprague uh, was fined. He was found guilty and fined several shillings. 
paying off uh, as a result of that assault. All right. So Frank obviously knew what was his rights um, in Colonial Rhode Island, Colonial Province. I also believe that this industrious Frank fathered at least two sons by the name of Andrew and Rufus. Andrew and Rufus probably followed a West African custom of adopting their father's first name as their last name. Both Andrew and Rufus Frank lived and worked in Providence, Rhode Island in the 1700s. Both served in the militia. Both were called out to fight off threats to their community. Andrew died in 1756, but his brother Rufus lived on and served in the French and Indian War as a member of the militia out of Providence. Rufus, as a member of the Mil Providence militia, was only allowed to serve during a time of major conflict. Militia service was required of all able-bodied men between the ages of 16 to 60. However, this was not generally required for Black men who were normally exempted from military service and were instead required to perform other civic duties like road cleaning and repair. But during times of major warfare, the exemptions against Black service were disregarded, such as when Great Britain became involved in a war against France and France's Native American allies, the French and Indian War. Like I said earlier, Rufus served as a member of the Providence Militia from 1757 to 1762. He was stationed primarily in a region that is present-day Western New York State. He served in three separate campaigns. What you're looking at on the bottom of the screen here on the right-hand side is a picture of Fort Sandwich, which is located near Rome, New York, and uh, Rufus served some time at that fort. In 1762, when Spain jumped into the conflict on the side of France, Rhode Island would muster its troops to assist with the capture of Cuba, which was a Spanish colony during that period of time. Rufus and others made their way to New York State. They sailed to Havana. They laid siege to Havana. They captured the major, the major fort there and they would eventually end the siege on, siege on the winning side. After that, Rufus and his fellow troops would return home. On the screen is a picture of the 1774 Rhode Island colonial census from the town of Johnston, Rhode Island. After the war, Rufus settled in Johnston. It's a small town just northeast of Providence. He married, he had three children, two sons by the name of William and Ben, and one daughter by the name of Hannah. The Frank household was one of only 10 free black households in Johnston. The family is enumerated in the 1774 Colonial Rhode Island Census. On the far right side, which is the area of the census that was designated for blacks and Native Americans. Rufus and his family were part of a growing black population before the Revolutionary War. There were approximately 500,000 people of African descent which made up about 20% of the population. Most of them were enslaved. A very small percentage of Blacks were free, but they lived under very restrictive conditions like the Franks. Free Blacks composed 10% of the Rhode Island population. As the war progressed, the desires of these 500,000 people could be separated into two categories as defined by historian Ira Berlin. The enslaved were looking for liberty and freedom, and free Blacks were looking for equality. So if you were enslaved, you were looking for your liberty. If you were free, you were looking for equality. Throughout the duration of the war, this group of people would judge who they could, who could and would grant their desires, the British or the Americans. Now, William and Ben would follow in their father's footsteps and serve in the military during the Revolutionary War. And on the screen, you can see that Rufus Frank is listed on the left-hand side of the screen and he is listed as one adult male, two, there, then there are two young men under the age of 16 captured on the census, one adult female, and one young woman under the age of 16 on that census. And that is the household that the Frank brothers came out of. But before William and Ben, excuse me, before William and Ben could serve, there needed to be a change in American military policy. By November of 1775, the royal governor of Virginia, a gentleman by the name of John Murray, he was also known as the Earl of Dunmore, he had been run out of his, court, his quarters at Williamsburg by Patriot forces 
and he was conducting his official business on a ship in Chesapeake Bay. On November 7th, 1775, he issued a proclamation that promised freedom to slaves who fought for Great Britain. And part of that offer is on the screen. And it says, Dunmore's proclamation of November 1775 says, and I do hereby further declare all indented servants, Negroes or others appertaining to rebels, so only the patriots uh, enslaved people would he offer freedom to, but he says they could be free if they are able and willing to bear arms, they joining his majesty's troops as soon as may be for the more speedily reducing this colony to a proper sense of its duty to his majesty's crown and dignity. One of the many enslaved men and women who fled to Dunmore and the British lines was an individual by the name of Henry Washington, who had been enslaved to George Washington. Henry became a member of Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment. There's a picture of a member of the Ethiopian Regiment on the screen. Dunmore trained over 800 formerly enslaved men in the basics of musket shooting and formation marching. He also had special uniforms made for them with the insignia, quote, liberty to the slaves, unquote. That regiment fought in two major battles, the last battle being the battle at Great Bridge, Virginia, where they lost. They lost lives at both battles, and they also lost lives to smallpox. However, Dunmore's proclamation created one of the first mass emancipation of Black enslaved people prior to the Civil War. An estimated 80,000 to 100,000 enslaved people fled to British lines during the war women and children among them, and they were all seeking their freedom. The Frank brothers were able to enlist after a change in American military policy. At the beginning of the war, General Washington banned the use of black soldiers in the Continental Army. The militia troops that fought at the initial battles at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill were all diverse. They had white, black, and Native American soldiers serving together. But Washington believed that you could not have a professional army with black soldiers, and he could not attract Southern planters by arming blacks, free or enslaved. So in July of 1775, after he took control of the Continental Forces, he instructed his recruiting officers in the following manner. And part of the quote is there on the screen. He said this, quote, you are not to enlist any deserter from the ministerial army, nor any stroller, Negro, or vagabond, or person suspected of being an enemy to the liberty of America, unquote. That issue, that instruction, caused the expulsion of Black soldiers who were already fighting with the Continental Forces. Washington would continue his policy throughout the fall of 1775. However, Dunmore's proclamation occurs. And to counter that, Washington would start to revise his policy towards black soldiers. Washington was pressured by command officers and black community leaders like Prince Hall, who was the leader of the black Freemason movement in, in America. He would be pressured by these people to allow the service of black veterans, especially soldiers who had already proven themselves in battle. So Washington changed his policy. In January 1776, he allowed for the enlistment of free black veterans. The following year, he allowed for the enlistment of all free blacks. By war's end, over 7,000 black soldiers would serve in the Continental Army. William Frank, the older brother, signed up to serve with the Rhode Island State Brigade um, in April of 1777. Later that year, he was enlisted into the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment. His younger brother, Ben, signed up to serve with the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment at Providence in May of that year. He was 15 years old. His father probably had to give him his permission for his son to serve. Why did they enlist? Probably for a variety of reasons, mostly due to economic concerns. They were members of the working class. They were listed as general laborers. Their father, and I haven't found any records that their father owned land. So with enlistment, they could look forward to earning, they thought, a steady wage, receiving food, receiving equipment. And then given the limited opportunities for free Blacks and other members of the working class, military service was one of the few ways to better your life. Congress at that point had approved enlistment bonuses 
And Congress has also approved promises of land up to anywhere between 100 and 500 acres at war's end after your service. Were soldiers of color treated differently than their white counterparts? They initially served in integrated regiments and integrated companies. So as freeborn black men, the Frank brothers were receiving the sought after equality that many free blacks were looking for. What was the actual service that they were getting themselves into? Well, first off, they became members of the second Rhode Island Regiment. The state of Rhode Island was tasked by Congress to provide two infantry regiments, the first Rhode Island and the second Rhode Island. And both of those regiments were integrated at the time that the Frank brothers signed up. But the Frank brothers were not signing up for easy duty. Continental soldiers lived tough lives. Pay was very sporadic due to the limited treasury of the new federal government and state governments. They were issued muskets and bayonets. Their issued clothing consisted mostly of hunting shirts, similar to spots that they were large enough to cover all their other clothing and equipment. Shoes were always in short supply. In the summer months, they'd go barefoot. And in the winter months, they sometimes had to wrap their feet in cloth. There was a army surgeon that said that he could track um, the movement of the Continental Army in the snow by just following the bloody footprints because the soldiers were not wearing shoes. Soldiers often resorted to foraging in the countryside for food. They had to deal with diseases that ran rampant through their camps. There was a smallpox epidemic during the war, which caused General Washington to start an inoculation campaign. And on the screen is how Colonel Israel Angel described the situation of the man of the men who served under him in the Second Rhode Island Regiment. Colonel Angel was the leader, the commander of the Second Rhode Island. And he says, the regiment is scandalous in its appearance in the view of everyone, and has, because of this, incurred from the surrounding regiments, from the inhabitants of the towns through which they have lately passed, the disagreeable and provoking epithets of the ragged, meaning their clothes look terrible, lousy, meaning their clothes had a lot of lice in them, naked, meaning they didn't have enough clothes, regiment. Such treatment, gentlemen, is discouraging, dispiriting in its tendencies. It does effectually unman the man and render them almost useless in the army. So that is what the Frank brothers were signing up for. Their first year of service saw them be involved in something called the Battle of Red Bank. The two Rhode Island regiments were dispatched to defend the forts along the Delaware River between Pennsylvania and New Jersey in October of 1777. Fort Mifflin, which is uh, designated by the yellow arrow, was on Mud Island. And that is where the Maryland Continental Troops were uh, stationed. And Fort Mercer is at Red Bank, and that is where the Rhode Island troops were sent. Initially, the Rhode Island troops were able to defend Fort Mercer and repel British and Hessian troops. However, the British were able to capture Fort Mifflin, forcing the Rhode Island troops and the, the Maryland troops to evacuate both forts. As a result of the battle, as they were leaving, 14 were killed and 21 were wounded. They would receive praise and commendations for their uh, initial exploits at Fort Mercer, and their commander would receive a commendation sword from the Rhode Island Assembly. But what was their an ultimate reward for their service at Ray Red Bank? Winter at Valley Forge. Yeah, it's, they were on a downward trajectory here. <laughs> so after this major battle at Red Bank in New Jersey, the Frank brothers and their regiments marched to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania for the infamous winter encampment of 1777 to 1778. While in camp there, American troops suffered major losses due to disease, illness, and desertion. Washington described the encampment as, quote, composed of men half starved, always in rags, without pay, and experiencing every species of distress, unquote. The food rashes were in such short supply that many of the army regulars threatened to revolt. Their slogan was, quote, no bread, no meat, no soldier, unquote. Don't blame. At the end of 1777, Washington notified Congress that over 2,800 soldiers were unfit for duty because they were either bet barefoot or otherwise naked, meaning they didn't have the proper clothing. William Frank, 
the older of the Frank brothers, was one of those soldiers. A week later, an additional 1,000 men were on the sick row. Over 3,000 soldiers deserted. The Rhode Island regiments were decimated as well. Due to their losses, they barely had enough soldiers left to form one regiment. To solve this problem, the Rhode Island commanders decided to fill their dwindling ranks by recruiting and enlisting enslaved men from Rhode Island. But just to show you how bad it was, here are some of the, the quotes from Colonel Angel, the commander of the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment, and then from General James Varnum, who was in charge of all of the Rhode Island troops at Valley Forge. Colonel Angel wrote, quote, I am sorry to inform you that a very great sickness and mortality prevail among the Rhode Island troops, which is just to proceed in some measure from the badness of their clothing, their cloths, unquote. And the rate of desertion also concerned Angel. He wrote back to the General Assembly, desertion is what we may ever expect so long as the soldiers see that the public faith is not to be dependent upon, unquote. General Varnum, who had overall command of the Rhode Island troops, was also concerned about the state of his troops. Quote, the two Rhode Island battalions have been sickly. They have lost a considerable number. This is owing to their immense fatigues, meaning their battle in the summer past, unquote. So they decided to come up with this. Well, let me go back here for just a second. I had a chance, an opportunity in 2019 to go to Valley Forge and took some pictures. Um, that is a reconstructed uh, cabin that the soldiers actually lived in during that winter. I am sure they didn't look that good. All right, there's, <laughs> there's no way. And I am standing at um, a marker there at Valley Forge, and that is where the Rhode Island troops actually encamped. So that is actually where my ancestors encamped. So that was kind of special for me there. So Varnum and others were able to convince General Washington in the Rhode Island General Assembly to allow for the enlistment and the recruitment of enslaved men in lieu of their freedom. So the Rhode Island General Assembly passed something called the Slave Enlistment Act, and that was passed in February of 1778. And it would stipulate, as you can see on the screen, it is voted and resolved that every able-bodied Negro, mulatto, or Indian man slave in this state may enlist it into either of the said two battalions to serve during the continuance of the present war with Great Britain, that every slave so enlisted, excuse me, so enlisting, shall be entitled to and receive, receive all the bounties, wages, and encouragements allowed by the Continental Congress to any soldier enlisted into their service. It is further voted and resolved that every slave so enlisting shall, upon his passing muster before Colonel Christopher Green, be immediately discharged from the service of his master or mistress and be absolutely free. So Colonel Christopher Green, who was in charge of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, was accompanied by his captains. He was assigned to leave Valley Forge, that winter encampment, and go back to Rhode Island to recruit and enlist individuals to serve in a new regiment. The recruitment and enlistment of enslaved men did not last very long. Rhode Island slave owners opposed the new law, fearing the consequences of having armed ex-slaves against those who are still in bondage. Their opposition prevailed, and in June, the Rhode Island State Assembly repealed the law. So it didn't last very long. And, but in that four month period, over 100 free and formerly enslaved African Americans enlisted for service in the Rhode Island regiments. Among those were individuals by the name of Africa Burke and Cato Green of Providence. There was a formerly enslaved man from the town of Johnston, Rhode Island by the name of Primus Brown who enlisted, Johnston, Rhode Island being the hometown of the Frank brothers. And you also had free blacks that enlisted during this period of time, like individuals like Peter Daly, who came from Warwick, Rhode Island. So I said that they were able to go back and enlist over a hundred formerly enslaved men for service with the first Rhode Island Regiment. But this may also be the first case of sanctioned segregation in American military history because these new recruits were combined with over 70 documented veteran Black and Native American soldiers from both the 1st and 2nd Rhode Islands to form the new 1st Rhode Island Regiment. Military historian Robert White Wright Jr. calls what happens here, and, quote, an experiment in segregation, unquote. 
So the Frank brothers and other soldiers of color were transferred from the second Rhode Island Regiment into the reconfigured first Rhode Island Regiment and the reconfigured 1st Rhode Island Regiment became known as the Black Regiment. And on the screen are copies of two documents that address that change. On the left side of the screen is part of an application um, for pension of a young white private, William Champlin, who was in the 1st uh, Rhode Island Regiment. In it, underlined on the screen there, in it he testifies that the white men in Colonel Green's regiment, the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, were transferred to Colonel Israel Angel's regiment, the second Rhode Island regiment. No reason really given. The second document is entitled return, meaning a listing of freemen enlisted for the war. I believe this return lists some of the freeborn and previously free men of color who served with the Rhode Island regiment, just to make a distinction between those who were formerly enslaved and those who were free before their service. And the red arrow is pointing to the names of William and Ben Frank on that list. So William and Ben's first battle in their new regiment would occur on their home soil in Rhode Island. The regiments were assigned to participate in something called the Rhode Island Expedition. The main objective of the expedition was to drive the British troops from Equidnet Island in the middle there of the uh, state and the important port city of Newport. The expedition was led by native Rhode Islander, John Sullivan. It was the first joint effort between American and French troops so the Rhode Island troops, the Frank brothers and their friends had to be excited about the opportunity to kick the British completely out of Rhode Island. Not only that, but they were gonna fight side by side with their new allies, the French, who had come to the aid of the Americans after the American victory at Saratoga, New York in October, 1777. The expedition failed when American forces were unable to overcome the defenses of uh, Fort Adams, which is located in Newport, Rhode Island. Additionally, French naval ships were prevented from participating in the expedition due to bad storms and damage that occurred to the fleet. They had to flee to uh, Boston for repairs and they did not return to give support. Also, British reinforcements were being sent to repel the American attack. So because of all of this, the Americans were forced to flee Aquidneck Island on August the 29th. And it was during that retreat that the Battle of Rhode Island occurred. If you look on the map at point seven and eight, here, right here, the British forces from Fort Adam were chasing the American forces and caught up to them at point seven and eight. And that is where the battle occurred during the afternoon hours in the very heat of the day in August. Um, the Rhode Island regiments were assigned to protect the right wing of the American line. And during that really hot and sticky uh, afternoon, they were able to repel a combined British and Hessian force on three separate occasions. And they were also being bombarded with volleys from British ships that were in the harbor. But by the end of the day, because of their, their ability to withhold the British advance, they were able to safely retreat from the island. But there were casualties. Uh, overall, 30 were killed, 137 wounded, 44 came up missing and casualties uh, in the Black Regiment. There were th three who died, nine were wounded, and 11 um, were missing. And, but the Frank brothers were among the survivors. And after the battle, the 1st Rhode Island Regiment was then assigned to shore patrol duty in their home state of Rhode Island. And maybe they shouldn't have been assigned to shore patrol duty in their home state of Rhode Island because the younger brother got married. <laughs> got married. Already knowing that pay sporadic, but I'm going to get married to this woman. And he did that. It was during this period in January 1779, Ben Frank got married. He was 18 years old. He married a young woman by the name of Sarah Wilbur, as you can see on the screen there. That is the actual uh, certificate of marriage. Sarah was the mother of one child, a child by the name of Abraham. Ben and Sarah were married by Elder John Gordon of the Sixth Principal Baptist Church of East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Elder Gordon also married Ben's younger sister, Hannah. And Hannah got married to another soldier of the Black Road Regiment, a guy by the name of Solomon Watt. All right, so we have the younger siblings getting married during war. But after about a year of marriage, Ben Frank would make a very pivotal decision. 
So let's review his life up to this point. He's 18 years old. He's married with a family to support. He's serving with army that couldn't afford to clothe or feed them most of the time. He and his fellow soldiers were called the Neki Lousy Regiment. He survived the miserable winter at Valley Forge. He fought in two major battles, and on both occasions, his regiments had to retreat. He may have lost comrades at both battles. At this point, he may have been convinced that the Americans could not win the war. So what did he do? He deserted. He left. In March of 1780, he deserted from the Continental Army. That was not uncommon for Revolutionary War soldiers to leave their companies and regiments for home. One fifth to one third deserted during the war. As I stated before, he had poor pay, poor equipment, lack of food, and even homesickness that drove many soldiers to desert. For Ben, there was the additional burden of marriage and having to support a family with insufficient and unsteady military pay. The military records on the screen indicate that Ben signed up for the duration of the war. So he was supposed to stay until the war's end. But there was another term of enlistment that was also average during this period of time. And Ben may have believed that he signed up for a three-year enlistment and that his enlistment was almost completed. But for whatever the reasons, Ben left leaving his brother and wife behind. His wife, Sarah, would return to her hometown of Middleborough, Massachusetts, taking her son with her. His brother, William, would continue his service with the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. Now, I don't know how the segregation of the Rhode Island troops affected Ben and others, but I have tracked over 73 soldiers of color, free born or free before their enlistment. Before the Slave Enlistment Act and segregation, only three deserted. After the act, 17 deserted, including Ben Frank and his brother-in-law, Solomon Watton. Solomon, however, was retaken and Solomon would later die of disease in camp before the end of the war. Ben was never retaken, but for whatever the reasons, Ben left. His brother continued to serve. Why? Well, he may have felt responsible to uphold the family name after his brother deserted. He may have felt a sense of loyalty to fellow soldiers in the Rhode Island Regiment. Maybe he didn't want to jeopardize his chances of getting land or money for his service. And maybe he believed that the Americans would win and he would reap the benefits of being a veteran member of that army that liberated America. For whatever the reasons, he re-enlisted in February of 1781 for the duration of the war, and he would continue to serve with the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. On the screen is a listing of some of the Rhode Island soldiers that was compiled in 1781, and I just wanted to point out that Ben Frank, excuse me, that William Frank is the third soldier from the top, and at this point in time, He's around 21 years old. He's only five foot five and three quarters. And as you can see, that is the average height during that period of time. And then he's listed as being a common laborer um, in the state and um, city that he was born in and the state, excuse me, the city that he resided in upon his uh, appointment to the, to the military and where he was recruited in Tiverton, Rhode Island. In early February of 1781, the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island regiments were put into one regiment. They were consolidated into a single Rhode Island regiment. And that was after the 2nd Rhode Island regiment had taken heavy casualties in the battle at Springfield. So this new consolidated regiment was commanded by an individual by the name of Colonel Christopher Green. That was the colonel that was sent back to Rhode Island to recruit enslaved people. Colonel Israel Angel retired at this point. That spring, Green and his soldiers found themselves encamped at Westchester County, New York, near Pines Bridge. And their primary responsibility was to guard against the Continental Line, to guard the Continental Lines, I should say. One of those soldiers was an individual by the name of Lieutenant Jeremiah Greenman. He was assigned to command the guard at Pines Bridge. That was one of the two bridges that spanned the Croton River and the Northern Barrier, barrier something that they called in Westchester County neutral ground. But 
This was an area of almost daily confrontation between the loyalists and the patriots, because in Westchester County, there's still they had a, long, a large population of people still remaining loyal to the crown. All right. And this area was also known for guerrilla warfare that was being carried out by a loyalist group that was led by an individual called Colonel James Delancey. This group was known as Delancey's Corps of Refugees, and it was made up of American born soldiers who were living in Westchester County and they had chosen to remain loyal to the British cause. At sunrise on May 14, 1781, Delancey led his militia of over 200 infantrymen towards Pines Bridge, which is where Greenman and his guard were stationed. One group would attack Colonel Green's headquarters, which was located at a place called Davenport House. The second party attacked Greenman's guard at the bridge. And on the screen is part of how Lieutenant Greenman described what happened to him that morning. He says, this morning I was alarmed by the appearance of a party of cavalry supported by infantry, which proved to be Delancey's Corps of Refugees. They soon surrounded me and being vastly superior in force and having no prospect of escape, I thought it most advisable to surrender myself and the guard prisoners of war. They informed me that Colonel Green was mortally wounded and Major Flagg killed, unquote. Along with Jeremiah Greenman was uh, Peter Daly that was also captured as a prisoner of war. He originally enlisted during that period of time of the Slave Enlistment Act period, but he was previously free in February 1778. And he and Lieutenant Greenman would remain prisoners of war of the British until later that year. Delancey's troops killed eight soldiers of the first Rhode Island at the headquarters. Prince Charles was killed. Prince Charles enlisted in the spring of 1777 at the same time as William Frank. Charles served with William and Ben Frank in the same company during the Valley Forge winter. At this point in his career, Prince was a veteran of four years and had survived two major battles at Red Bank and Rhode Island. And he also survived the winter at Valley Forge, but he would not survive this attack. Along with him were killed um, Africa Burke, a formerly enslaved man, Cato Bannister, another formerly enslaved man, and Simon Whipple, another formerly enslaved man. The most brutal fighting took place at the Davenport House. I had a chance to go back to Westchester County to make a couple of presentations there about the Frank brothers week before last. And um, I am standing in front of the Davenport House. Someone actually lives in that house, but it has been designated as a historical site. And it has a, it doesn't look much different than it did then. Somehow or another, they were able to climb up and get into the second uh, story windows. And that's when they attacked uh, Colonel Green and his guard of Rhode Island soldiers. And um, so they get ambushed there, Colonel Green and a small detachment of soldiers. Uh, the major Ebenezer Flagg was shot in the head while reaching for his pistols while he's in bed. Colonel Green was wounded in the initial attack and his wounded and dying body was strapped to a horse and dragged about a mile towards British lines. And we took the route that we think they may have taken him. Eventually, Delancey's troops left the Colonel's body at the side of the road and he was later buried along with uh, Major Flagg at a site uh, at a Presbyterian church in Yorktown, New York. I personally believe that the reason that Colonel Christopher Green's body was so badly used after they already knew he was wounded and dying, that um, they went after him like that and dragged his body down the road like that because he was the commander of black soldiers. Um, on the other side there, on the left-hand side is a the Pines Bridge Monument. And um, it's, a, it's a great monument and really captures all different aspects of the Black Regiment. There is Colonel Green, who looks like he's just out of bed. He's barefoot. He's got a sword and he's fighting the people that are ambushing him. There is a, a statue of a Rhode Island, the Black Regiment soldier with his gun at the ready. And on the other side is a portrait of the Native American soldier who are also part of the Black Regiment. So William Frank survived the attack at Pines Bridge. As a member of the consolidated excuse me, consolidated first and second Rhode Island, he served at the pivotal battle of Yorktown 
in October of 1778 that for all intents and purposes ended the war. He served for a total of six years. He was 23 years upon his discharge. 12 years after his discharge, he would eventually receive his back pay and allow land bonding, which he promptly sold. He settled in his hometown of Johnston, Rhode Island after the war and became part of a growing population of free blacks of over 3,400 in the state of Rhode Island. Another thousand blacks remained enslaved in Rhode Island. On the 1790 census, uh, there's a picture of it over my shoulder here. He is listed as the free head of a household of two, indicating that he got married. So what happened to Ben? Well, his life was a little bit more complicated, <laughs> really complicated. After he left the Continental Army, he signed up to serve with the British troops. I said earlier that Ben wasn't alone in fleeing to the British. Thousands of enslaved people fled to the British lines as a result of Dunmore's proclamation. At the end of the war, many of the defeated British troops and loyalists, those Americans that stayed, remained loyal to the crown. Um, among them, black loyalists, at the end of the war, they made their way to New York City, which was the last British stronghold in America. Those loyalists remained at New York until the final peace treaty was negotiated in Paris and passage was arranged for them to England or the British colonies in the Caribbean and Canada. Part of the Paris Peace Treaty promised the return of all confiscated property by the British to its rightful American owners. This included the formerly enslaved. However, British officials refused to return many of the fugitive slaves that had run to the British seeking their freedom during the war. But the British were willing to make fair compensation to the owners of enslaved persons not returned. In order to do so, they compiled an inventory of Blacks within British lines. This inventory became known as the Book of Negroes. Ben Frank, a free man his whole life, and former Confederate soldier is listed in the Book of Negroes. There's the page that he's listed on in the book. He's listed as Ben Frankum in the book. And in the book, he is listed along with 3,000 other Black loyalists. In October 1783, Ben Frankum was a passenger on a ship taking him and other loyalists um, from New York to Nova Scotia. And they were part of over 80 ships and 40,000 loyalists headed to Nova Scotia. Ben and others embarked on the bridge Brig Elijah that would deposit Ben Frankham and the rest of his passengers at Port Mouton in late 1783, which is right, here, right there on the map. By April of 1784, Ben Frankham had relocated to the settlement of Birchtown, Nova Scotia, which is several miles northwest of the larger city of Shelburne. Excuse me. Birchtown became the largest free black settlement in North America with a population of over 1,500. Many of them lived in makeshift huts, pictured here on the screen. Many of the black loyalists found the Northern climate and frontier conditions in Nova Scotia difficult. And they were also subject to discrimination by other loyalist settlers, many of them former slaveholders. The land that was given to black loyalists was the most rocky, and hard to cultivate compared to the land given to the white loyalists. In 1792, the British government offered black loyalists the chance to resettle in a new colony in Sierra Leone, Africa. More than half of the black loyalists in Nova Scotia, nearly 1,200, <laughs> departed the country and moved permanently to Sierra Leone, including Henry Washington, George Washington's formerly enslaved man. Ben, now calling himself Ben Franklin, yeah, he's hard to track. <laughs> he eventually married, again, a woman by the name of Margaret Jackson. She was the daughter of another Black loyalist. And he eventually settled in Granville, Ferry, Nova Scotia, which is in this area right here. Ben Franklin and his wife had nine children that survived until adulthood. All were baptized in the Anglican Church, 
and he passed away sometime after 1838. <clears throat> so we're back to the landscape. Thomas Henry Franklin is a direct descendant of Ben Frank, Franklin Franklin. He passed along his family's history to the next generation. Before his death, he passed the story to his sons, Peter, in the middle there, and John William Franklin, my grandfather on the end here. In the early 1900s, John left Nova Scotia for New York City looking for work. Okay, so this is what really happened. <laughs> Let me tell you the story I heard from my uncle. So one of the first jobs, one of the first gigs that you would get if you were a young person in Nova Scotia was on a whaling ship. They were whalers. And John uh, Franklin Sr., my grandfather, we called him Pa, was uh, working on a whaling ship and he got hurt. And the ship dropped him off in New York City and he just stayed. All right. <laughs> he found a job there and he just stayed. All right. So following the Frank slash Franklin tradition, both Peter and John served in World War I. Peter served with a battalion from Canada and John Williams served as part of a New York regiment. John William married late in life. He settled in Lynn, Massachusetts, where my mom was born, that's her dad, and he passed away in Lynn in 1966. Here's the deal. The only reason that I know that Pa was from Nova Scotia, Canada, because when we used to visit from Toledo every summer to uh, East Lynn, Massachusetts, staying at his house, he had this big Canadian flag in the dining room. And I'm like, Pa, why do we have a Canadian flag in the dining room? <laughs> and he says, that's where I'm from. I'm from Nova Scotia. Never gave that up. Always proud of it. He passed along the story of the Frank brothers to two individuals that I call the Frank brothers part two. Check out the names. John William Franklin Jr. and Ben R. Franklin. All right. The cool guy with sunglasses is the individual that told me the story, the oral history. Anyway, they knew the oral history. And they also continued the Frank slash Franklin military tradition. Both of them served in World War II. My Uncle Buster, John, served in uh, the Philippines. And my Uncle Ben served in Europe. He served in France. Both of them served in Korea. Okay, so here's another story. <laughs> so, so the older brother, John, decided that it would be a good idea for he and his brother and their friends to all sign up for the National Guard. Oh, it won't be hard. We'll just spend some time in the summer at camp. We'll have to do something once a month. No big deal. Then Korea hits. <laughs> and they both have to go to Korea. They're shipped, they and their friends are shipped to Korea. And this time, the Franklin brothers, part two, are serving together. And they argue the whole time that they were in Korea. At least that's the way my uncle Benny tells me. So in 2006, the state of Rhode Island dedicated a monument that honors the formerly enslaved and free blacks that served during the American Revolution with the Black Regiment. <clears throat> it is located in Middletown, Rhode Island, near the site of the Battle of Rhode Island. The names inscribed on the walls of the monument are a testament to the brave men who fought for American liberty and freedom. Ben Frank's name is listed on that wall. Maybe that's a testament to the conflictive feelings that many American colonists had to deal with during the American Revolution. I don't know. Maybe it's just a testament to the actual service of these young men. I want to end with a different type of legacy here, and I'm going to read a section from my book. So <clears throat> here we go. Learning about the Franklin family background and origins has been a fascinating personal journey. Their struggle to gain standing in their communities and to fight on equal footing with their white counterparts in the Continental Army has helped me to put my own life and career choices in perspective. <clears throat> like the Frank brothers, I followed in my own father's footsteps when I became a police officer in Toledo, Ohio in 1976, one of the first female officers on the department. My father, a well-respected police investigator and Civil War history buff, instilled a love of history in me and like Rufus Frank to his sons, was an inspiring figure in my life. But did the heritage from my maternal line instill an unconventional streak in me 
that allow me to envision myself as someone equal in a male dominant workforce. It is possible that this non-conforming trait came from the Frank slash Franklin lines. Throughout my research, I have often asked myself, <clears throat> which of the brothers I identify, identify with most? And even though Ben's life and decisions provide a better framework to understand my own predilection to take the road less traveled, as the oldest sibling of my family, I tend to identify with William, the older brother, who was persistent and steadfast in his service. But I am not judgmental or unsympathetic to Ben's actions and decisions. To the contrary, the combination of these two dichotomous personalities has found a home in this author and motivated me to not only continue their history of public service, but also to write their story. All right, that's it. Open for questions. So any questions? Anyone have any questions? I told the story that good. <laughs> yes. I have a question. If um, the regiment that uh, the Frank brothers served in ever came across any um, of Dunmore's recruits uh, from from the slave uh, free slave population, or from what I understand, even after that regiment was disbanded, the Ethiopian regiment, there were some splinter groups that made inroads towards the north. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they ever came across them. You're talking about some of the guerrilla groups that um, have found their origins in the Ethiopia re regiment. Um, there was one group uh, led by an individual that they called Colonel Ty, T-Y-E, and he conducted a lot of guerrilla attacks in New York State during that period of time. Whether or not uh, members of the Consolidated First and Second Rhode Island, <clears throat> excuse me, came across them, I don't know. It's a possibility, though. It's a possibility. It could have happened. Sure. Definitely could have happened. Good question. Any other? Qu yes. Very good. I love this, Kara. <laughs> sort of uh, any unconventional methods? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the DNA stuff. The, the the ability to cooperate the Franklin oral tradition with DNA results was really pivotal here because the story is that the first Frank came from the west coast of Haiti, excuse me, west coast of Africa by way of Haiti, which that little middle part makes it a little bit more difficult, right? There's one more thing you have to prove and then wound up in Rhode Island. So I was able to convince my Uncle Ben to take that. I didn't think he was going to do it, but he did. I said, hey, do you want to do a DNA test? He said, yeah. I'll do it. So we got them all swabbed up and sent it in. And his test results came back as a match to a young man who lived in present day Togo. And he was a member of the away people, like I said earlier. And he was also a match for a young man that lived in the Dominican Republic, which is right next door to Haiti, right on the island of Hispanola. And I went, OK, that's great. So I get the results. I was working, by the way, I was working as safety director then. And I got the results via email. And I closed the office door and I read the results and I was very happy. So I called my Uncle Ben immediately. And I said, Uncle Ben, listen, you're a match for this person in West Africa. You're a match for this young man in Dominican Republic. Crickets. He was happy about West Africa. He said, I told you, I told you. I said, I know. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, that's nothing, nothing. No response for the Dominican Republic. I said, Uncle Ben, you're a match for... They don't even speak French over there. I said, okay. <laughs> all righty then. I said, do you understand the connection? Yeah, I understand, but they don't like those. Okay, I, I understand because they don't. They don't get along at all. So yeah, I was I was lucky to have that, um, that advantage to be able to, to kind of back up the story. And everything, it's really interesting, but everything that my Uncle Ben told me about the history of his family, I have been able to prove Otherwise, in the military records, in the vital stats, in the census records, he at one point he told me, well, we have some family in Maine. I said, we don't have family in Maine. We did. We did have family in Maine. So he's always been accurate and correct. It's just amazing. Those, fam those family oral traditions are a really good source of information. You, you have to prove them, but they are a really good source. So thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes, Chase. Oh. All right, how do I do this, uh, Becky? <laughs> Thanks, Chase. No problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we should be able to just, okay.
uh, any literature you would recommend looking at for microhistory and then surprises in your research. Okay, microhistory. Yeah, do you have any literature you would recommend? Mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of literature for microhistory, um, I can uh, recommend two written by the same author, Alfred Young. Um, one is uh, The Shoemaker in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. It's about the events that lead up to the American Revolution. And it's also about issues of class. Um, and then another work by the same author is Masquerade. And it's about uh, the service of a female who was masquerading herself as a male when she served in the, the during the Revolutionary War. So I would recommend those two things. And then my book, of course. <laughs> my book, of course. And the other one was... Were there any surprises that came up during your research? Surprises. I think the initial surprise, well, from the very get-go, we didn't realize that we have our ancestry that we could trace all the way back to the 1690s. And then uh, it was surprising to find out that we had two ancestors that fought um, in the Revolutionary War in Rhode Island because we did not have any connections to Rhode Island at that point in time. So the, just the general story was very, very surprising. Um, and then to find out that the brother split, that the brother split was also very surprising. Any other questions? Is there another one up there? Is that three? Okay, just thank you. All right. Great. Any other questions, anyone? Yes, I'm sorry. World has changed from when you started researching or before you started the research as opposed to afterwards or any way that you've changed the way that you think or the way that you think about things? I think when you understand your family history, sometimes you can understand yourself a lot better. And as I said in the section that I read from the book that helped me to understand why I always felt like I had to do something a little different than everybody else. I think that helped me a lot there. I think the other thing is that I was always curious as to why my grandfather, of course, came from Canada, but I was always also curious about why my mother was born and raised in Massachusetts, because everyone else in my family and my friends and their families, we all came from this little area in the Midwest, Toledo, Ohio. So it was all, it always made me feel unique and special to have a, one parent who was from Massachusetts and then a grandparent from Nova Scotia. So I always had that instilled in me, but now I really understand the full story of it and what that means. So yeah, it, yeah, it did change me. I mean, if, if someone comes up to me and says, well, you know, you shouldn't speak poorly about America or politics or this and that, I'm like, look, people, I've been here, my people have been here a long time. <laughs> so I'm not hearing it. Yes, right there. It's not, I mean, that's the narrative beyond your, you know, the missing part of the narrative about the American revolution, mm -hmm. black involvement within it. And um, so it's an important story. And I think for a lot of students, I like, think, know that. Is the constant reminder that black folks are involved in every war. Right. What we know is Right. I think what is what's fascinating, you need to get back to your point, is the fact that they you had men in the Franklin line who fought and served in the American slash British military all the way back to the French and Indian War. I mean, you can't push any farther back than that. So that is also another that was really surprising. That was very surprising to me. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, wait a minute, in the back. There's one in the back. One of the things, there any questions to Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming, y'all. Any connections to the War of 1812? I haven't really spent a great deal of time looking at that. I do know that at one point, Ben Franklin, when he was in Nova Scotia, was part of the, a militia group there. I don't know if he actually fought in the War of 1812, however. And it's really interesting that I can find, uh, I can trace Ben Frank in Nova Scotia, Canada, a lot easier than I can trace William Frank because family oral tradition and Michael Benny hasn't been wrong about anything. So I'm sure this is accurate too. But family tradition says that after the 1790 census, William Frank left Rhode Island and went to Louisiana and settled there. And I have not been able to track him exactly there. 
So um, I don't know if, if he or any of his uh, offspring were involved in the War of 1812, but that is, that's one of those areas that I really want to uh, clear up because there are Franks listed throughout the Louisiana census. I just don't know if they're my Frank. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Did you have another question? Any other questions? Yes. Did you do the ancestry uh, DNA test or so, doing more than one? So when I did my Uncle Ben's test, it was like, like early 2000s. It's, it's been a while. So what I did was I looked for the in DNA testing facility that had the largest database. What well, wasn't Ancestry then, it was Family Tree DNA. Okay. It was Family Tree DNA. Now Ancestry is. So if I was doing it now, I would use Ancestry or 23andMe. Now there's another thing online that you can upload your results from Family Tree and 23andMe to something called GEDmatch. And that takes in all of these other databases as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Right. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.